So I think we can get started. Uh, first off, thank you very much for coming. Uh, we're very excited and honored to be here. So uh, we don't have any slides. This is just going to be an informal discussion uh, amongst people who have all done uh, some pretty neat security automation things in different companies. Um, so we're going to talk about some of the sort of tips and tricks they've learned over time, some things they tried that didn't work as well. And uh, we're also going to allow uh, a bunch of time for questions. So please uh, feel free to ask a bunch of questions, uh, even start thinking about them now. Because if no one answers and uh, asks any questions, we're just going to sort of awkwardly sit here staring at each other for uh, perhaps 20 minutes. Uh, also, I, just to give you some additional context, uh, we all chatted before this, and we all agreed that panels where everyone agrees about everything uh, is very boring. So we're purposely going to hopefully find some things we don't agree on, uh, and we're all friends. None of us take it personally, uh, but we think that that's interesting in that the same idea or tool or process may uh, be very useful in one company, but less so in another because of culture or other things. So hopefully we're going to tease out some differences here. Um, okay, with that being said, let's just quickly uh, go through everyone and just say uh, your name, where you work, and uh, yeah, just to introduce yourself. All right. Hey, uh, I'm Dev. I work at Dropbox in security. Uh, and yeah, is there anything, fun fact or anything? <laughs> uh, yeah, feel free to do a fun fact or uh, like a sentence about maybe how the security teams are structured within your company. Okay, yeah. So uh, I lead this team called Product Production Security, which is focused on uh, basically all aspects of protecting our users and their data. And uh, so application security, abuse prevention, uh, uh, abuse and threat intelligence, and uh, data security. So pretty broadly, anything to do with pro protecting our users and a product platform. Uh, some uh, somehow is in this team. So, uh, yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Asta. I lead the AppSec team at Netflix. Um, and so my team is sort of responsible for uh, securing all the applications that help run the Netflix business as well as the Netflix streaming product. Um, and then we also run the Bug Bounty program and piece of capabilities for uh, Netflix. And then I'm a part of the broader team that does sort of engineering security, which is sort of within our broader InfoSec organization. Hi, everyone. My name is John Heisman. I'm the deputy CISO at DocuSign. And I run our security engineering team. That's application security, vulnerability management, and security infrastructure. And uh, my fun fact is that when I started the AppSec team, I was actually in engineering. So AppSec was in engineering for at least half of its life at DocuSign. Now we're in InfoSec. Um, interesting pros and cons as to, to how you structure your teams. Uh, hi, I'm Divya. Um, I work on the uh, application security team at Snap. I, I manage that team. Um, our team works on building like secure uh, default frameworks and tools, um, um, automation tools, uh, the security reviews of new products and services that we ship. Um, we also do um, reviews for services that already exist that we are nervous about. Um, we run the bug bounty program and we also contribute to the larger security training efforts at Snap. Um, uh, hi, my name is uh, Doug DePerry. I'm the um, director of product. I almost forgot what I did for a second there. Um, <laughs> I'm the director of product security at Datadog. Um, I realize Datadog's not as much of a household name as you know some of these, uh, but uh, Datadog is a, a cloud-native uh, SaaS. Uh, monitoring solution. Um, we ingest metrics and logs and application traces and, and, and provide it to customers in, in a single pane of glass. And what my team does is, is focuses on, you know, application security, um, kind of through three main tenets. We, we build software to kind of help developers do their job more securely. We break software to find bugs and do code reviews, that sort of stuff. Um, and then education is kind of that last piece. And so that's kind of our approach to uh, application security. Awesome, cool. Uh, oh, and uh, my name's Clint Gibbler. I'm a security consultant and research director at NCC Group. We do penetration testing and pretty much anything related to security. And uh, I started thinking about this uh, in a lot more detail once I was working with uh, a number of different companies, helping them set up uh, security automation, helping them figure out where static analysis uh, can give them the most value or not, uh, and things like that. So I've also been uh, very interested in this space. Um, OK, awesome. So uh, again, could I? Uh, Let's maybe go down the row again and talk a little bit about, can you give a, a high level overview of how your SDLC works and sort of what security automation is currently in place? Uh, and if you want, maybe one or two things that you have found to be the biggest ROI. 
start from this side. Yeah. Yeah, we can start oh, at this oh, side. I just win. Yeah. Um, uh, so uh, Datadog's got a pretty uh, informal SDLC. Um, we don't put a lot of, um, you know, uh, we don't do a lot of ground rules as far as, you know, what language they can use or what frameworks and that sort of stuff. And so, um, you know, it's a lot of freedom. There's a lot of dev teams. That's a lot of things for us to kind of keep track of. And so we automate. Um, one of the main things that we've done uh, lately is is we automate just trying to keep visibility. We, we call this ProdSec Ops. And so we kind of have a, a central place where we can um, submit stuff like, uh, you know, we monitor very specific source code files in GitHub uh, for changes. Um, stuff related to like auth or, or you know anything sensitive like that. Um, uh, Trello cards uh, that have a security label. Um, we send the results uh, of some of our scanning systems to to this thing as well. And that's we call it ProdSec Ops. And, it, and it's uh, you know every team member takes a one week turn and they kind of just you know just really helps us gain visibility uh, on what the org is doing without having to be everywhere at once. We can't you know attend you know attend every single stand up because not every team has a stand up every day and stuff like that. So um, that's one of the main ways that we've been automating is providing a lot of value for us. Um, yeah, it's a lot similar as uh, Datadog at Snap. Um, we use a lot of different frameworks, languages, uh, a lot of ways to do things. Um, there, there's a bunch of automation tools that we've hooked up to uh, different stages of uh, the dev life cycle, if you can call it that. Um, we have uh, pre-receive hooks that sort of look for certain things as you push code out um, to to uh, GitHub, we have um, um, analyzers that look at your code as you open your pull request and like comment on them with like, hey, you should be using some other tool instead. Um, we have uh, tools that we run post deploy, um, looking for like certain issues like, did you misconfigure auth? Um, uh, should this be public or private, etc. Yeah, and, and we also have uh, tools that we want people to use, like this is a key manager that, the, that you should be using to do, uh, to store your secrets, um, and just the secure by default frameworks. This is what you should, should be using if you want to do X. So um, Clint told me I had to disagree with everyone, so we don't do any of that. Um, no, I just want to highlight a couple of things we do. Um, starting with uh, training, uh, we wrote all of our training, AppSec training in-house. Uh, it was a hugely time-consuming exercise, but we, we looked at sort of commercial offerings and we figured it's rare that developers at DocuSign start building an app completely from scratch. They're using our existing um, frameworks, our existing components, and they need to know how to use those securely. So really our training focused around using, using those. Um, another, so all throughout our SDLC, we try to have lots of touch points with developers and we try to keep it sort of pretty uh, lightweight. So one of the things we do is we have a team set up in all of our org in GitHub so that uh, at any point developers um, on a PR, they can, they can mention the AppSec team. So it's like a nice informal way that developers can actually ask us questions. Hey, at AppSec, like, you know, is this line correct or should we be thinking about this? Um, so really, yeah, our, our process was think of all the ways throughout the SDLC, all the phases where we can just have a, a low friction way of getting that visibility. Um, so yeah, for us, um, we have sort of like, uh, in Netflix infrastructure, we sort of have this concept of the paved road, which is sort of like, you can go do whatever you want. We have a very polyglot environment. Um, but then there is like the, you know, paved road for supported things. And then we have a similar concept for security. Um, and then in general, like what we focus on a lot is how can we get folks to adopt the security paved road? A lot of the tooling that we've built historically has been sort of in the space of things that that we consume ourselves and we try to um, sort of expose it to the developer once we've had a chance to like verify an issue or something like that because uh, we have a strong bias towards not interrupting the developer if we don't have to. Um, and then um, we also have some automation in sort of like the um, like the self-service from the standpoint of you can submit a security questionnaire to get a standard set of uh, guidance based on your use case and things like that. Um, but then uh, sort of looking forward in 2019, we're sort of leaning heavily into to the self-service space from the standpoint of how can I tell you what to do for security by looking at sort of everything about the about your app and your app inventory and your risk based on how your app is deployed and things like that. So that's kind of the major sort of automation work we're doing right now. 
All right. So uh, Dropbox has the best. Uh, it's SDLC. <laughs> uh, we uh, we think about security throughout the SDLC, uh, automation throughout the SDLC. Uh, so design phase, implementation phase, uh, launch. So during design phase. Uh, there's involvement from security. We strongly encourage developers and evangelize to them that they reach out to security during design phase. There's design reviews, threat modeling documents, uh, standard frameworks on how to design things right. Uh, and then there is the implementation phase. There's automatic code review blocks, uh, automatic code audits based on static analysis that flags suspicious code. Uh, during rollout, uh, as the uh, like, one of the cool things we do is as as product teams roll out new features uh, to early access, uh, we actually roll it out to we have a special population in our A/B testing framework that is our bug bounty crowd, and we actually automatically roll it out early to the bug bounty crowd, saying, hey, if you find a bug before it rolls out to the rest of our users, that's even better for us. And then. Uh, and finally, there's dynamic analysis and continuous testing after the uh, feature has been released to everyone. And so, uh, you know, developer relationships throughout, and there's a whole separate uh, focus on platforms where we look at what are the common bugs that are affecting people throughout this lifecycle, and where we can write better libraries, better developer education, uh, better dynamic analysis, static analysis to detect and prevent these flaws. Uh, and so, a lot of it is, I agree, developer relationships. Uh, one of the things. Uh, I think that was left unsaid that we have also found very powerful is relationships with uh, product managers uh, because uh, you know they are the ones who are thinking about the product and what we want to build the earliest, often before engineers. And so working with product managers and getting involved during their design and ideation phase and evangelizing how we think about security has also been pretty powerful. Uh, so yeah. Yeah, one uh, interesting trend I found, uh, both talking with you all as well as uh, talking with a number of other companies, is that uh, so many people have basically built the same sort of internal tooling that, uh, you know, given a new PR or commit, run uh, arbitrary pluggable tools on them. Um, so I think everyone on this panel uh, have done that uh, at their company. And I'm just curious, like quick poll of the room, uh, who is at a company who's like built something for your use cases that um, yeah, just automatically scans either static or dynamically new code uh, pushes? Like, is this a pretty common thing? Yeah, tons of people. Uh, is this something you've written yourself or is it um, like a tool you've bought? Or I guess raise your hand if it's something you wrote internally. Okay, most people. Uh, has anyone bought a thing? I mean, so, sort of like a like a question half hand. Okay. Are you asking bought and used or bought and stopped using like this? <laughs> yeah. Uh, did you did you buy something and then it just didn't fulfill your needs because of specific like how Dropbox works? Uh, I don't know whether it's how Dropbox works. Uh, I do I do think uh, it's a very uh, I, I'll talk specifically about code blocks. It's a very, I don't know what to call like a very rude thing to do to developers, telling them their code is not good. Uh, and so something that we can write and manage in-house, update in-house has been pretty powerful. Uh, we bought in the sense that we asked our, uh, so we use Fabricator internally. We asked Fabricator to update their tooling so that one of the very powerful things that we did was uh, developers can upload a new diff and the static analysis runs and adds a blocking security reviewer and leaves a comment saying, this is why the blocking security review was added. And if they fix that thing, the reviewer automatically goes away at the next diff. And that was a feature that was actually uncommon in many of code review systems. But just that has been such a huge win. Developers love the ownership they get uh, and, and also reduces overhead on us. So that's been pretty powerful. Uh, but in general, yeah, the tooling we use for this is in-house. Uh, some of this might be Dropbox specific because we tend to focus on secure libraries. And so, you know, we just say like use the secure version of crypto. We we just automatically block on using any crypto function that is not the the one we have blessed. And so that's a very simple static like I don't even know that's a simple grep to write. So so that worked better than uh, many of the other engines that reliability and speed and all these issues were out of our control. So yeah. We did something similar with the the thing that comments on diffs. Um, it's not a blocker, but it gives the dev devs the opportunity to be like. This doesn't make sense. It's a false positive. Let me thumbs that down. And then a security engineer can go look at why was this a false positive and how can I improve tooling around that? Do you track metrics around number of thumbs downs and thumbs ups, sir? Do we track metrics? Yes. <laughs> you do? Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and have you actually used those metrics to inform, uh, like customize the checks over time? So you're like, oh, this rule uh, tends to be like 90% false positive, so let's uh, either make it more precise or maybe remove it entirely. Um, we've, we've done a little bit, not a lot, but uh, it's an ongoing process. Okay, nice, very cool.
Yeah, we tend to look at uh, you know risk versus reward, and if there are particular rules that fire a lot, and they are not very high risk, we kind of move them to audit, which is post commit rather than during the code review. So this allows developers to move faster, and then we can later on go in and be like, okay, you've committed the code. Can you? This is not urgent. This is not the worst thing in the world. But just this is not hygienic. Like just change it, please. <laughs> and you developers like that, sir. So. So I think um, one thing we'd probably all be in agreement in is um, obviously static analysis um, has the potential to flood you with false positives. Um, one way to, to limit that is essentially changing the, changing the problem to, as Deb said, uh, enforcement of uh, secure libraries. So at DocuSign, we wrote a bunch of wrapper classes uh, around um, some potentially dangerous operations, and now we enforce their usage over the original framework version, and that's a super simple problem for static analysis to solve. But one thing I wanted to say uh, on that is, you know, how did we persuade all of engineering that, hey, you got to use our thing. It's better to use our thing, our, our wrapper code. Uh, the way we did that, actually, we, um, we, we canvassed our developers, and we found that you know, one, one big thing at DocuSign is telemetry-driven design. And so we built telemetry into all of these components. So let's say it's a component to prevent uh, server-side request forgery. So it's a wrapper around uh, like you know, so something that makes an HTTP request. Well, we also baked in a bunch of telemetry. So um, yeah, we can easily say to our engineers, hey, use our component, you get this for free, you get this monitoring for free. Um, for us, a lot of um, for us, a lot of the code analysis stuff is actually more sort of greppy, trying to find ad type patterns, and that has worked better for us than actual static analysis, um, just because I think we've done um, sort of some experiments and testing with trying to uh, run static analysis on large parts of our code base, and at the end of the day, like the risk versus reward just hasn't been worth it for us. So we've leaned more into uh, kind of like finding anti-patterns as opposed to doing sort of like full static analysis. Um, this is a question for you, sorry. I'm asking the question. Yes, no, please do. <laughs> I can just okay. hang out. <laughs> um, how difficult was it for you to drive adoption of these wrappers? Because it's one thing to build a wrapper or a library and another to uh, enforce it or to, to have thousands of applications adopted. So I think, uh, like a lot of things that we roll out, um, we don't go from zero to 100%. So we don't go from no one using it to everyone using it within a week. Um, this goes for a lot of things. Partner with teams that want to use this stuff, that want to be good partners with security. Um, roll it out, make sure you iron out all of the bugs so that when you present it to teams that might be slightly more hesitant to, to adopt it, uh, you can be pretty guaranteed that they're not gonna run into problems. Um, so I'd say that was probably the easiest way. Uh, we, in our case, we just went in and did the changes ourselves. Uh, it was painful, but it felt right. Like, why should we export our pain to all the other developers' team? Uh, and uh, that taught us a lot, right? Like, there have been cases where we thought the secure design we were uh, proposing was this beautiful thing, and it's secure. And then when you try to actually use it yourself, you're like, oh, this is a terrible idea. And, uh, <laughs> and, and so then you do a better design. So part of that is also like forcing yourself to use the APIs you're providing kind of teaches you a lot and makes you rethink what's appropriate. So. Um, I was actually thinking about, you know, kind of the, er the earlier question a little bit about, um, you know, why couldn't you use, why, why did you have to build this yourself sort of thing? And um, I just, w w we find a lot of times, and it's not that Datadog's doing stuff that's, you know, so off the wall, like we use GitHub, you know, <laughs> it, it, it's not, uh, you know, there's a centralized place to do a lot of this stuff. But um, I just think the way some of these tools are architected, and I'm not going to pick on static analysis, um, but really static analysis, uh, um, you know, it, it, it just, um, you know, we want to, I don't want to get alerted for, for every single problem uh, or my team. I don't want um, developers to have to log into a separate web UI and learn a whole separate way of doing things. Um, I want to present it to them in a way in which I know will work for Datadog's, you know, development culture and, and, with, their, and with our developers' workflows because I don't want to make things more difficult for people. Um, and so that means I'm going to have to do things. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I can't expect every product to, to, to fit into that. Um, and so we end up writing a lot of custom code 
code and wrappers around um, you know tools APIs, uh, which has worked out pretty well for us too because it's also it's, it's more extensible and we can kind of plug in you know uh, additional tools as, as time goes on. But it's um, you know it's it's the model with a lot of tools and it's not just static analysis. It's a lot of these oh just log into our thing and well no I don't want developers to do that. I don't want to have to deal with all of that. I want to make it I want to present to them the problem in very simple terms and show how they can fix it very quickly and easily. And if they have problems, they reach out to, to, to the security team. They're not hitting up support for you know this, this web portal or something like that. So, Yeah, and just to parrot something John told me like uh, a while ago, uh, but one of the reasons why they uh, built the orchestration part is that uh, by you being in control of the glue and fitting things together, you can easily plug in a bunch of tools where if you're relying on a vendor to do that orchestration and glue, uh, you're sort of dependent on them. Uh, but by owning that part, you can sort of plug and play different tools based on if they're useful or not to you. Uh, and I thought that was a very insightful way uh, to do it. Uh, so I come from an academic background, and so I have a you know, PhD in CS, so I am very... Uh, it hurt me to like you know all the the shit talking of static analysis was hurting. For, for the record, uh, yeah. But uh, I love static but, analysis for the record. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but I also agree. Yeah, we it's all love beautiful. Grep. We all love grep. It's yeah, fun. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but the one of the things that actually you know I was doing some static analysis research even in grad school. One of the things that someone told me I forget who was the reason why grep is so nice is because because uh, if you think about it, grep is wrong probably more than static analysis because static analysis has some intelligence in it, and so grep is usually wrong much more often. The reason it is less annoying to developers though is because developers understand grep. And so very often they don't like they see why grep went wrong and they might even tell you, hey, you need to fix your regex and they really enjoy telling the security team how to fix their regex. Uh, and uh, and that's that gives them a very positive like rush. And uh, and so that's that's I mean, yeah, you know, regexes are hard, dude. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but that's fine. Right. Like in the end, you're trying to uh, like the relationship is also important and annoying developers less is very important. And so, you know, this magical black box said, you have a bug is annoying to developers. Grep has a bug and grep, uh, developers know why it's wrong. Is actually, even though it's wrong more often, is less annoying in my experience, which is you know, one of those things that I didn't re like, really understand when I was in grad school. But. Yeah, I think there was actually a, like a, a white paper from Coverity a while ago that was talking about how they improved their scanner engine to find some very complex detailed bugs and uh, it actually wasn't a good thing because it, it was like, oh, this is actually a bug, but it was so confusing to people reviewing it that unless you knew like esoteric C language features, like it would just seem like a bug. Um, so it actually wasn't uh, useful to them because of that. So being able to understand the results is obviously very important. Um, okay, so one uh, last thing before we uh, open it all for questions. Um, so many uh, times people are giving conference talks like, hey, here's this cool thing we build, or look how awesome our program is, but I think uh, less often people talk about uh, failures they've had or things they've tried that didn't work, um, uh, which I think is a loss for the community because it, hopefully we can save ourselves a lot of time trying to uh, go down avenues that didn't actually pan out. So um, yeah, just what's something that you've tried that didn't that you thought would be very useful but wasn't, and, and not something you like tried to hack on for a day, but something you actually invested you know a non-trivial amount of resources in uh, that just didn't either work at all or pan out how you expected. I would say um, making certain commercial DAST applications log into our single page app. Um, has anyone here had a similar problem? <laughs> yeah. Um, Why is everyone I, laughing? <laughs> it kind of feels. <laughs> it kind of feels like, uh, in particular with DAST, a lot of the tool commercial tools are just behind modern development, and that makes it super super painful. But we're obviously told that you need DAST, you know, various compliance uh, reasons, and you know, it makes sense when you think about it. Yeah, I'd love to do dynamic analysis, um, but uh, so that's something. Yeah, we worked on for a while. Um, ultimately, you know, tried a bunch of vendors and uh, still have actually not had great success. Uh, way, the way we eventually solved this and actually got decent coverage is we went and talked to our QA team who had a great set of uh, functional sort of end-to-end -end tests, and we basically hacked on their code to add security into those QA tests. Um, that had some pain along the way. Uh, when we started breaking tests, um, you know, QA were like uh, going crazy. Why the hell have you broken this test? But you know, that sort of um, yeah, we we managed to repair that damage, and and we have some really great coverage. Um, but we we still do use a commercial DAS tool, but we like to compare its results with the results we get from our in-house QA system. And as you would imagine, they're just um, like non-comparable. 
I guess I have the other mic. Oh, sorry. <laughs> like, why isn't anybody else talking? Um, uh, I think one one of our uh, biggest failures, I guess, is or it's, and it's actually a little bit entertaining too, is um, that that ProtSec Ops thing I was talking about earlier. We we were looking into using um, keywords in Slack uh, to, you know, like we wanted to try to like get involved as early as possible, right? We wanted this visibility throughout the org. And we're like, well, hey, people are talking in Slack about this new feature or this new thing. I bet if we look for words like, you know, hash or crypto or MD5 or stuff like stuff like that'll give us like a little bit of insight into, um, you know, what's happening. We can join the conversation, and it's really cool because we're just friends chatting on Slack, and it's all good. Um, it turns out it's really, really creepy just to pop into <laughs> public, uh, you know, even though they're public chats, and so it, it was, it didn't really work out too well for us. So we we didn't put a ton of time into it, but it was still like you, you always got to think about the creep factor of what you're doing. Like all this monitoring, all that all that sort of stuff, the telemetry, it's it's all great. Just remember that, you know, people are people too. <laughs> yeah, project <laughs> Beetlejuice. Yeah, ex just, exactly. Oh, well, here we are. Hey, what's going on? What are you guys talking about? Like, how are you in this channel? <laughs> so a year or two ago, um, our company developed a lot of features, a lot of products we would be constantly shipping. Um, and uh, developers used to ask us for security review um, all the time. So we, we had this huge queue of like security reviews we had to deal with. Um, and our turnaround time was uh, understandably very, very high. Um, and at the same time, Google released this uh, thing called Vendor Questionnaire, VSAC. Uh, and we were like, someone came up with the brilliant idea of like, oh, great, why, cannot we, why shouldn't we like take that uh, change it so we ask you a bunch of security questions or just a bunch of questions about, you know, are you building a web app, mobile app, are you using web view, are you X, Y, Z, and depending on how they answer, like the tree expands even more and gives you advice on, like, you should be doing X and not Y, you should, like, look at the documentation on how to use, uh, um, how to generate uh, randomness, etc. cetera. Um, and we had really high hopes on that. and. Turns out the developers still just wanted a human to uh, to do their review, so they would just find the shortest path to completion of that questionnaire. So it would just be like web, mobile, other, submit. <laughs> <laughs> so it didn't quite work out, but we're sort of trying to figure out how to improve on that. So it's interesting because Clint told us to disagree with each other. Actually, the questionnaire thing has worked pretty well for us. It has helped us sort of uh, create touch points with teams that we don't normally will work with. Um, and then uh, like sometimes they'll either reach out to us. We are like security help Slack channel. But then a lot of times they will fill out like the Zoltar surveys, uh, which is sort of like a similar questionnaire thing for us. And then um, I think the one thing that didn't quite work with that is I think we had functionality for actually automatically like filing JIRAs for what you were going to do for security work. And I think we've had maybe two or three people use it ever. So that, that part of it was a fail. But the actual guidance piece, I think, like worked in our environment. Um, but then anyway, it is a failure story. Um, this is, I'm telling it on behalf of Scott, um, it was on our AppSec team, um, is I think a few years ago, they spent what was it? six to nine months, Scott, on getting sort of like an internet-facing deployment for like a dynamic network scanner. And at the end of it, just really didn't find anything. <laughs> yeah, that's the end of that story. Yeah, and, and I, I think to me, that's sort of a, uh, I guess it's too strong to say like an inspiring story, but, it, but I feel like, well, no, context. So I feel like, I'm a big fan of the various talks uh, Netflix gives. I think they've released a bunch of very cool tools. And uh, many of the talks you give, uh, I think, are very insightful and useful uh, in this space specifically. So I think uh, it's nice to see, like, oh, even people who do such great work in so many contexts, like, you know, no one's perfect. So to me, that's why I said inspiring. <laughs> Good job, Scott. <laughs> uh, the list of failures is very long. So uh, it's like that moment in a movie when the actor has 100 things to say. Uh, I don't, I think I'll just uh, jump off of what Divya said. We also had a very similar idea. We failed for a completely different reason, which is funny. Uh, so we thought, yeah, like we had this threat modeling form. Uh, we learned from Adam. Uh, we took the like, you know, uh, what are you building? What could go wrong? Like the standard threat modeling form. 
uh, we took away the, uh, I mean, based on initial developer feedback, we took away the, uh, did you do a good job at it? Because they got mad about it. But uh, <laughs> but we kept the three questions. And and then after a while, we were like, you know what? It'd be really nice to make this like really beautiful flow and people can click through when they say web, we'll ask these XSS questions. When they say like desktop, we'll say RCE questions, like whatever. It'd be great. We had this visions of like UML documents and like these flows and stuff. It was going to be great. Uh, we rolled it out. Developers hated it. Uh, and the reason they hated it, uh, I think maybe you have a nicer team than they. I don't think anyone said I want to talk to a human. Maybe because they have to talk to me. But like, uh, but uh, but the reason they hated it was funny. Uh, before this, this was a, a Dropbox paper doc, which is like think of it like a really nice version of Google Docs. Uh, but. Uh, <laughs> Represent, <laughs> uh, but but, uh, but uh, the thing is, in a Dropbox paper doc or a Google doc, you can collaborate with others in the team. You can work with your product manager, you can work with your designer, your range manager, tech lead. You can all collaborate together. A question they don't know the answer on, they can comment and ask each other questions. In a form or a survey, you can't do that. Like, and and I was like, yeah, that makes sense. There's a reason why we invented stuff like Google Docs. <laughs> like, uh, it's miserable to write. Like, I don't recall the last survey I filled where I was like, oh, that was such an amazing experience. I hate writing surveys. <laughs> and so, uh, so yeah, we killed that. We went back to a simple form where people could work together, answer each other's questions, and that continues to work much better. So, uh, so yeah. All right. Very cool. Um, all right. So, uh, does anyone from the audience have any questions? Awesome. I think we have all the mics, by the way. OK. Uh, I, I can go ferry uh, mics around. Uh, yeah. You can repeat the question. Yeah, we'll also repeat the question. I kind of want to see Clint run around. Yeah. Uh, but I would love to yes, see it. Yes, please. <laughs> OK. Yeah, so any thoughts on storing the? I I don't have good advice. Uh, because I think uh, we run it most like like any of our other code. And the security team has worked very hard to have like solid secrets management infrastructure in production. And so we use that. And the one thing is like the credentials we use for testing, the accounts we use for testing, if they get hacked, like fine. Like we don't like it's also not sensitive. Like they're not we don't use any sensitive accounts. But also, yeah, we use a normal secrets management infrastructure. But if you don't have a secrets management infrastructure, yeah, I mean, honestly, keep it in the file. Like if, if you don't have secrets management infrastructure, there are other bigger problems maybe. <laughs> yeah, if they aren't like sensitive uh, credentials and you don't have a secret management solution, you could consider something like um, I know, like an S3 bucket, but relying just on like permissions for access rather than worrying about like should I keep that encrypted? What if the bucket becomes public, etc.? Um, or KMS on AWS or GCP. Um, it really depends on where your tools are running and what is available to them to share. And uh, there's no one size fits all answer here. Yeah, we, we also rely on sort of like our secrets management solution that our platform security team builds. And I, I think I'd argue that like that's probably a more important thing to build first than building a bunch of other security automation. So when you have these foundational security services, those are a really important part of making your app stack program successful because you need to have a solution you can tell your developer that they can easily deploy to solve these problems you're finding, right? Because it's like if you don't have a solution to point them to, then you finding the bugs doesn't really matter. Mm. Okay. Yeah, oh, sorry, Doug. And uh, if if um, that solution isn't well documented and easy to use, that's when you end up with you know creds in code. Um, so I think no matter the sort of level of maturity of your program, always scanning for secrets in source code, like some, something will pop up now and again, no matter how mature you are. Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, for a young, uh, blossoming AppSec team that you're like, yeah, it would be nice to have all these things already built. But let's say you join a new company, small team, where do you start? What are sort of the nice big wins? Or where should you focus your time initially? <laughs> yeah. um, I think uh, at that point, I think when you're a new team, uh, the biggest thing that would matter is like actually building those relationships with parts of the company that are building sort of like the highest risk assets that you care about. So think through kind of like what that is for your business model, right? Like for us, it's credit card information uh, and like PII and viewing history and all of that sort of stuff, right? So um, you should like go and spend the time on building those relationships with those teams and like try to really understand like the problems they're facing and then uh, like maybe use that to sort of prioritize like how you want to like start spending your time because they can tell you a lot more about the security problems that exist in your uh, ecosystem. 
Um, I was going to go with something like cases of bourbon, but um, it, it is very overwhelming, and, and you have to kind of just, uh, you know, uh, brutally prioritize, you know, and I've been saying that for years, and I'm still not good at it, right? It's, it's, it's difficult because it changes every day, several times a day. Um, uh, one of the first things I, I did at, at Datadog when I started, because I was, you know, one of the first handful of security hires, was I focused on infrastructure security, because that's what we needed. Like, that was what was going to bite us the worst. And... I mean, you know, my boss hired me to do application security and product security, and I'm like, I'm going to go do infrastructure stuff. And he's like, do you know much about that? I'm like, well, no, but I'm going to figure it out because we need to. Um, and that was, you know, that's kind of how I prioritize that sort of stuff. So I think brutal prioritization and then just kind of keeping up with that and not forgetting about that stuff either. You know, like keep make a list and keep it, and then you can revisit it when you've got five or six people and you've got multiple teams and that sort of thing. I would say um, seconding sort of building those relationships because that's a great way to actually build out an AppSec team, hiring internally. I'm sure we all agree it's really hard to hire great AppSec people. Um, one way to do that is to find those people that are interested in security and QA and ops and engineering. Um, start with a, maybe a security champion model and then eventually persuade them to join your team. Um, I would also say look across sort of historical data on bugs you have, identify trends, identify systemic vulnerabilities, don't play whack-a-mole, just try and solve that entire class. So that goes back to building like wrapper components so you can just eliminate entire classes. Um, so, um, so I did join Snap when there was, I was the first AppSec person I think, or maybe the second. Um, so, yeah, the security program was pretty, like, non-existing. Um, I think the first thing that, and this may be, like, baby steps, but you really, really need to get to know the infrastructure and what you're dealing with. Um, ask people a bunch of questions, and as you're talking to them, you realize, like, there are some clear gaps that you need to, you can immediately start tackling. Um, and, you know, going off of what the other said, if you're looking for specific teams that you should build relationships with, like uh, at a B2C, it's probably like a growth or identity teams who you're gonna run in, into a lot because in a lot of ways, their goals are quite the opposite of yours. Um, so to make sure you get to know them and uh, stay in touch so that you get all the latest scoop of like what they're building and um, you can really be an advisor and take care of those teams. Uh, I would just add one more thing. So I agree with everything, unfortunately, because the plan was to disagree. But uh, but I think the other thing I've seen many others trip up on, and there are also a bunch of good talks at this conference on how to start up a security program. The one thing I've seen people trip up on in like my friends and other security programs is the choice, right? The analysis paralysis of like, oh, do I do this? Do I do that? And uh, you know, it says a lot about how nerdy I am that my uh, management references are all computer science. But uh, I think of it as like a query optimization problem. And if you know how databases do query optimization, they set a fixed time to make a decision. And then they just make the decision based on how much, like at the end of that time, what they think is best. And then go with it. And then after a while, of course, all query optimizers also also see how the query is actually running and if it's taking too much time. If it's taking too much time or is going wrong, they again rechange based on the data that you're seeing. So so I think of it like that. It's just like make a choice, set a time, make a choice, and then see based on all the things that people said, right? Relationships, inputs from the business, data classification. Maybe the choice you made is wrong. Maybe it's right. But if it's wrong, change it. But uh, but. I think analysis paralysis where we just don't do anything for six months is probably not great either. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, I, I think the uh, mentions of uh, building the personal relationships are very interesting. Uh, but, but I guess one thing I wanted to ask is if you had to choose between, um, so definitely emphasizing the relationships and the people part, but between, say, building some uh, security automation in terms of like automatically scanning commits and things like that versus building wrapper libraries. So like of those two, if you had to choose one, which would you do first? Um, and I guess you could cop out and say some combination, but try not to. <laughs> I think in our case, it was pretty clearly writing wrapper libraries. But again, we are, you know, uh, we are, we do not have like arbitrary number of different stacks. Uh, we have a philosophy of like supported frameworks, supported stacks. Uh, we were a monolith for the longest time. Uh, so in that case, it made total sense to uh, focus on the wrapper libraries first, because almost always in security, preventing a vulnerability is going to be you know, better than finding it later. Uh, so in our case, it made more sense. Uh, 
I suspect it's not going to make sense for others. I don't, I don't know. If no one plans to disagree with me, then I can disagree with myself. But like, uh, <laughs> let me you know. You don't have to disagree. Uh, no, because in some other cases where you have like 100 different types of uh, uh, languages, 100 different types of uh, frameworks, then it rapid libraries just don't scale, right? Like one of our team members gave a talk uh, at this conference on internal application security where we had this problem. There we focus more on detection and runtime monitoring because uh, because yeah you can't write wrapper libraries for all the different frameworks and languages everyone wants to use uh, so yeah uh, that's a trade off okay now i can disagree with you um, <laughs> relationships don't scale that was going to be my point if you look at sort of maturity of growing a team any team really um, you might be able to get stuff done in an org organization through relationships initially but then you'll grow to a point and the engineering org or whatever org you're dealing with will grow to a point where you need to basically rely on processes you can't rely on just individuals anymore individuals come and go from companies you can write that wrapper code it's a one-time investment and it's done even if you have to write it for like 50 different languages hopefully it's done and then yes there's a maintenance cost but the cost of trying to maintain all of those relationships and continue those over time, I would go with wrapper libraries. I actually think like, so in that case, the problem though then becomes like you wrote something and then how are you getting adoption? Like it's maintenance is one problem, but the other problem also is uh, how are your developers becoming aware of this thing that exists for them to do this thing securely? Right, so like that piece, so for example, uh, we obviously are very automation heavy in our overall program, but then the partnership time that now in a more mature program that we spend with the teams, uh, it's really around sort of like adoption of those security building blocks that we have built for them, uh, and then try to sort of inform our guidance as much as possible with the data that we have about their applications. But you do need sort of like the relationship with the teams to be able to get them to do the right thing. I think the other uh, issue I have with processes is that I think processes make sense when you have a certain maturity around the tech and your platform. Uh, in the if the process is like think about XSS, that's not a great like process, right? So I think processes makes uh, are much more effective once the core parts of like your tech stack, your platform security, it, like if you don't have a secrets management system. A process that says, what are you going to do about secrets management is not great. I would rather focus first on writing those secrets management systems. And then once you have those building blocks and the issue is people aren't using them, in that case, yes, like the processes can help. But like I do think there's a lot of engineering that has to go first for uh, the processes to be effective. So I think uh, going back to the question, uh, whether I would use a library or um, um, like a scanning tool or whatever, really depends on the problem you're trying to solve, what the best way it is to solve them, what sorts of resources you have, and the current maturity of what you're trying to do. Like to give you an example, um, for the longest time we didn't have, we had one web app at Snap, everything else was mobile. Um, and so when we heard that there was gonna be more efforts to do, uh, to build more web apps, that was, it gave us an opportunity to go and be like, okay, we, need, we we can, this is a good opportunity for us to um, convince the, the web dev group that we need a framework that can take care of XSS uh, and just sort of agree that the, the, the framework level protection is uh, best for us because we're just starting off right now. So it really depends on um, your situation and what you have at hand. Okay, great. Um, yeah, let's go uh, back to the audience. Uh, yes, sir. You, uh, you try and align their personal interests with the interests of the team. So one of the things uh, we tried out last year was uh, getting some of the more um, junior people on the team to um, submit to conferences. And you know, with DocuSign, we don't create autonomous vehicles or you know, flying cars or anything. Um, so I you know, wanted to align their research with actual problems that we're solving. So that was the key, sort of, I wanted to have them have their research time and feel really excited about that and get to uh, present at a conference, but I wanted that work to be useful for what we were doing. So that's one way, just sort of listening to people starting out on their sort of journey in security, and maybe they don't know where they want to end up, but you can suggest some steps to them and just aligning those steps with, with what you're trying to do at the company and your team. Um, yeah, I would say, yeah, pe put people in the right roles, give them the autonomy to think big and to tackle big security problems. Um, if people think they're working on cool stuff, they won't leave. Sorry, Doug, go ahead. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would echo, I would agree with that. I mean, uh, 
not as fun. But yeah, I would agree with that. And, and also, uh, I mean, communication helps a lot. And sometimes you just got to be prepared for it, right? Like tech moves pretty quick. People jump around, especially in security, you know, uh, one year, two years, like it, it's common, you know, be prepared for it. Um, yeah, you got to try to keep people happy, but sometimes you have, you have a job to do as well. Um, and if you can kind of balance those things with research or just, you know, like knowing what the person likes and what they don't, what they dislike. Um, but then sometimes it just, sometimes they just want to move on. Maybe they completely disagree with the, with the philosophy of your team and there's nothing you're going to do to change that. Right. Um, and yeah, I think that's, yeah, so I definitely agree that there is something called healthy attrition, and I think that's fine. Um, I think the biggest important thing is you need to build a culture that people want to work in, because that's like really the biggest reasons I think people leave places is, one, if they're not getting to work on things they want to work on, if they're not getting to grow, or if they're just not identifying with the culture of the company. So I think that is really the most important thing. I think uh, I see it as like, there's nothing unique about security. Like... Uh, I think talking to your HR partners, they like culture and how to have a supportive environment, how to have, uh, how to challenge people. These are all problems all teams face. And I think uh, I, I don't see a lot that is unique to security. I think we should talk to people who have been doing this for a while who are experts and get their help. Uh, I certainly do. Uh, I think the only thing maybe <laughs> unique is like conferences like these. And so I'm, I'm really worried someone from my team is going to leave after looking at the view here. And uh, it's just... Uh, <laughs> But hopefully not. That's the They're <laughs> hiring. <laughs> yes. There's no company called Snap in Sandow. <laughs> um, so I would also argue maybe you want people to leave the team. Like I've had an AppSec engineer go into engineering at DocuSign, and that's great. You know, alumni, you want alumni of AppSec throughout the company so that you know you're in safe hands then. They're, they're, uh, that person will always come to us. Um, he knows our processes and procedures. Um, we, don't, we don't need to worry about anything that he's working on. Um, I, I saw a presentation a couple of years ago, I actually can't remember who gave it, but the idea stuck with me. They showed sort of the whole InfoSec org as like a subway map, all the different um, places you can come in, um, different teams, both internally and then sort of roles you can come into externally, and then the different change points where you can maybe switch from one team in InfoSec to another, like risk management to AppSec or something like that. And then all the ways you might leave InfoSec and go like either into the big wide world or, or into the company. So I thought that was a really interesting interesting idea. You know, we want to be, I, I said earlier, I built my AppSec team by taking people from QA, TechOps, uh, DocSign. I think of some of the um, partner teams in InfoSec, and we, we've taken people from legal, we've taken people from customer service. So I think you've got to think of it like that rather than just how do we hold on to these people at all cost. Okay, I think we have time for one more quick question. Um, yeah. yeah. How do you <laughs> automate uh, asset inventory and discovery? So yeah, in this conference, if you've talked to anybody from Netflix, I'm sure that one of the people from the security team have mentioned asset inventory. So, uh, but yeah, no, I think uh, like that is definitely, we're realizing more and more that that is uh, one of the most foundational components of kind of running a successful security program. So we're investing pretty heavily into that. For us, we are relying a lot on a lot of the cloud infrastructure tooling that exists within Netflix that the company uses for releasing software. Um, and that uh, is definitely a luxury to be able to rely on that. And then the problems we're trying to work on now is like how do we sort of gather all that data from the different data sources, correlate, and then come up with um, sort of the intelligence on, you know, like the risk of the app or why should we care about something. So the value that we as security people can add from the standpoint of sort of putting a security lens on top of all of that data. So uh, I think we're actually out of time, but uh, let's just uh, maybe leave every, if anyone wants to give sort of like a one sentence uh, takeaway um, from each of you. Yeah, sure. Datadog provides unmatched <laughs> asset management capabilities, whether you're in the cloud or so in the let data. Me, let me clarify, uh, oh. some uh, uh, security automation advice, uh, not, a, <laughs> not a product pitch. Uh, we're hiring as well. Um, uh, I think <laughs> um, gain. Uh, so, so I think my advice here is is to gain visibility and then automate. You have to know what you're working with. Um, we and we, we kind of did things a little bit opposite. And I don't, and I think it's worked out pretty well for us because we had some really talented security engineers that can that can r write some really good code. Um, and so that's worked out for us, and we're kind of gaining more of the visibility stuff um, uh, now. But um, my advice would be get the visibility first, and then start automating once you know exactly the data sets that you're working with. Great, awesome. 
he read my mind. Um, yeah, I would say like prioritize your biggest risks and just automate yourself out of each and every one of them and your automations, your solution and when and where you uh, implement that is going to be very different and do whatever it takes for your org. Um, so uh, one thing we, one topic we didn't really talk about, which makes me really sad, is sort of um, the telemetry aspect, like logging and monitoring. So that's hugely important. You know, the, these type of discussions tend to focus on um, assuming uh, best efforts to find all bugs when we ship code, and not sort of around the acceptance that, of course, there's going to be bugs. People are going to find those bugs, and you really need to know what's going on in your inside your application. So um, at DocuSign, um, you know, anytime an engineer makes a, a fix, anytime they go into the code to change something, we really advocate that they add telemetry that will help um, the security team. And then a really interesting discussion is then how to train your instant response team that are use, used to taking events from a SIM, for example, and making them understand alerts that are coming out of applications. I don't necessarily mean just things like um, plugging in a WAF and, and getting the alerts against you know, millions of people trying SQL injection. I mean things like actual alerts generated from within your code. Things like, hey, we saw this SAML, um, you know, SAML token coming in and it had multiple assertions in it, just sort of weird things. And how you respond to those. Um, I'll say, see if you can like hitch your security wagon to developer productivity, because a lot of the productivity engineering teams are building tooling that has like a big downstream impact. So if you can get your security tooling and things like that, like in by default in those tools, or if you can rely on some of the visibility things they're building, I think that's like usually a great way to be able to give yourself a head start because developers want to be more productive. So they are really committed to that tooling. Um, and did you know that there are security people on the Netflix team in LA now? <laughs> Man, wouldn't they all leave like the weather in North California to come here? Uh, I think the, I quote from one of my favorite books, uh, there's no silver bullet, there's just lots and lots of lead bullets. And so just <laughs> don't overthink, don't, just, just do anything that like, what seems like a good idea, do it, move on, do more things, do more things, stop thinking about looking for a perfect silver bullet. And, and added up a broad program and a series of steps will provide good security. All right, awesome. Uh, well, thank you all so much for your time. Uh, we'll be around to chat more after. But yeah, have a great day.